I hate the PC with a passion. Me, me going down to the store and buying Windows 95, I gotta get in my car, drive down to drive down to a store, buy a box, cardboard box full of bits, you know, you know, encoded on a piece of plastic, a CD-ROM, bring it home, read a manual, and install this thing. You must be kidding. You know, put the stuff on the net. It's bits. When he's not racing yachts, flying jets, or scoping out hundred million dollar estates, he's running one of the largest tech companies in the world, Oracle. The life of Larry Ellison is a true rags to riches story, but in his case, he became one of the richest in the world. As of creating this video, Ellison is worth around $60 billion off his Oracle ownership alone, and is the 10th richest person in the world. His company provides services for large corporations across all types of industries, including customers such as Dow Chemical, Amazon, and AT&T, just to name a few. Larry Ellison was born in the Bronx, but grew up in Southside Chicago. His family wasn't rich and he didn't grow up using a computer like most other tech billionaires. While in college, he taught himself how to program and began working for himself, writing programs part-time. Ellison actually dropped out of college twice and never ended up graduating, but he did discover computers and their potential and wanted to learn more about them. When he was 22 years old, he moved to Berkeley, California to start a career in tech and set the stage for the success to come. He started working entry-level jobs at various companies over the following years, but it wasn't until his job at Ampex where he would discover what he really wanted to work on. Ampex wanted to create a database that stored data on videotape instead of magnetic tape, which would allow data to be retrieved and managed much easier. In the 70s, computers could store data like they do today, but managing it was extremely complicated and inefficient. Ellison and his team were tasked with creating the software for this project, which was named Oracle. His time at Ampex was especially important because it set the foundation for what his future company was built upon. Ellison eventually left for another job, but he remained in contact with his friends at Ampex, Robert Miner and Edward Oates. A few months later, the three of them went into business together to do contract database work for Ampex and other similar companies. In 1977, with $2,000 of their own money, $1,200 coming from Ellison, they founded Software Development Laboratories. While working for this company, they discovered that programmers at IBM had been working on something called the Relational Database. This new type of database was extremely simple but revolutionary at the time. It basically allowed data to be stored in a certain format so that it could easily be searched and retrieved. This is commonplace today and you probably don't even notice it. Almost every digital transaction done uses this technology, and most sites online are using these types of databases. Pretty much every site stores their data in a relational database, whether it be user login info, products, or payment info. Back then, this wasn't the case, and a lot of traditional business had yet to be transferred to computers. This meant that there was a huge untapped market, and the technology was just discovered. It was a race to whoever could commercialize it first. Ellison and his team immediately saw the potential of this, so they studied the IBM research paper and wrote their own relational database software. They named the first version of their software Oracle version 2 because people would be more likely to trust the second version. Their Oracle software would go on to be their flagship product throughout the future. More specifically, the product is called the Oracle Relational Database Management System, which allows customers to build and manage their own databases. Oracle simply licenses the software for a minimum price of $47,000 and charges extra for maintenance and upgrades. And most large companies will need multiple licenses, oftentimes up to 10, so the minimum price is more like $500,000. You can quickly see how much money is in this type of business and how big the potential clients are. Version 2 was a success and Oracle quickly had contracts with the CIA, the US Navy, and large banks around the United States. By 1982, just three years after the first version was released, SDL had sales of $2.5 million. SDL wasn't alone though, IBM and other IT companies had developed their own database software and were a threat to the company. Ellison stayed one step ahead and planned to develop an even better version that would work on all types of operating systems, meaning they could get much more potential customers and secure their place in the market for the years to come. A year later, Oracle version 3 was released and it did just that. The company now named Oracle started showing incredible growth. Its sales doubled to $5 million and in 1985 their sales shot up to $23 million. A year later, Oracle sales reached $55 million and it worked with clients across all industries. 
Ellison was a millionaire many times over by this point, but it wasn't until Oracle's IPO in 1986 and the next two decades where he would see his wealth skyrocket. The biggest websites, from Amazon.com to Yahoo. And the biggest companies, from British Airways to General Motors, use Oracle for e-business. Do you? The 90s was a very interesting decade for Oracle and the tech industry in general. This was the start of the dot-com boom and computers were becoming more and more common in business and in people's personal lives. Thousands of tech companies were being created, most of them requiring some sort of database in order to function. Oracle and other database companies actually played a big part in the growth of the tech industry in the 90s. Without the success of the database companies, newly formed companies that required these databases would not have anything to build their infrastructure off of. Even though other database companies were seeing success of their own, Oracle always stayed steps ahead of the competition and no one was able to overtake them. Ellison was always determined to get rid of any competition and to control 100% of the market. In 1992, Oracle version 7 was released and it was a huge success. This version of Oracle was significantly better than any other version and it gave the company the reputation it needed of having the best database software in the market. Oracle was not only the leader in the market, but the obvious choice for customers buying the product. It was by far better than any of the competitors. Right now, the 10 largest internet sites in the world all use Oracle. Uh, 65 of the Fortune 100 uh, use Oracle for e-business. Other people advertise e-business a lot on TV, but overwhelmingly e-business is done on Oracle. We have a huge lead in supplying technology for internet sites. Why? Because we do big better. In 1994, the revenues passed $2 billion and Ellison's stake in the company was now worth $3 billion. But to get bigger, Oracle had to go beyond databases, and Ellison wasn't okay with being a multi-billionaire. He wanted to go all the way to the top. To do this, Oracle had to figure out how to improve its rank in the business software market. This industry was dominated by companies such as SAP and PeopleSoft that created programs used to manage things like finances, sales, and human resources. Oracle was in third place behind these companies, but Ellison had a unique strategy which would reshape the tech industry for the next few decades. He simply used the enormous amount of cash Oracle had to buy out companies that had the products he wanted. In 2004, Oracle bought out PeopleSoft for $10.3 billion and got a large portfolio of applications. These applications were now completely owned by Oracle and gave the advantage the company needed. Ellison was relentless. He spent $35 billion over the next few years buying out over 50 companies. He was willing to spend more money than anyone else in the tech industry, and he wanted complete control over the market. And his methods showed results. Revenue steadily grew throughout the early 2000s as well as his own net worth. In 2014, he stepped down as CEO, but it didn't really matter much in terms of his material success. He was worth tens of billions, and at the time, he was the fifth richest person in the world. He still owns over a billion shares of Oracle, which is about 25% of the company. He doesn't have a problem showing off his wealth either. He's made outrageous purchases over the years including a $300 million island in Hawaii, a $100 million yacht racing team, and a collection of cars including a $1 million McLaren F1. He is also a member of the Giving Pledge, meaning he'll give at least half of his net worth to philanthropy during his lifetime or upon his death. Aside from this and other philanthropic efforts, his company alone has done a lot for the world. Oracle is often referred to as the most important software you've never heard of. Its flagship product, the Oracle Database, is everywhere around the digital world, but you'll likely never see it. If you're watching this video right now, you've used Oracle plenty of times without even realizing it. Without it, we wouldn't have the possibilities on the internet or in business we have today.